It is 6.05. Uh, welcome to uh, tonight's uh, public hearing on the Smart Growth Overlay and uh, Subdistrict 2 uh, Zoning Ordinance Applications. Uh, I'd like to start by thanking Salem State University for making this space available for tonight's meeting. So I appreciate that. Uh, I'll also read um, our land acknowledgement. This land is Namkeg or fishing place where generations of indigenous peoples lived and passed through for centuries. From the village on the Namkeg River, now known as the North River, to Sachem Nanapashamit's fortification, now known as Castle Hill, the people of Namkeg farmed, fished, traded, raised families, discovered and invented, created art, and above all else, honored the lands upon which we stand today. We acknowledge that this is indigenous land and also acknowledge the Massachusetts tribe who continue to honor and hold this land into the present. Um, so a few quick housekeeping notes. Uh, this meeting is being streamed on SATV on its YouTube channel uh, live and also on channel nine and the recording will be uh, available on imaginesalem.org. That is also the website where you can find a copy of the draft application and additional materials related to 40R zoning generally. Uh, for tonight's meeting, uh, we're gonna invite the development team for the project to come up and provide a very brief overview of the, of the project. This public hearing is about the zoning, not about the project itself. Um, so after they uh, offer their presentation, staff from the city's Department of Planning and Community Development will provide an update on, will provide a presentation on the draft zoning application to the state, the process that that goes through um, and, and where we go from here. Uh, and then lastly, after those presentations have wrapped up, we're gonna uh, open up the floor for comments. We do have a, um, a uh, microphone that will be brought around. So if you have comment to offer, please raise your hand and it'll be brought to you. We are gonna um, accept written comment. The, uh, the, state, the state laws uh, on uh, 40-hour zoning doesn't require written comment, but we will be collecting written comment. Uh, and there'll be a slide at the end of the presentation with the email address you can send that to. Uh, that email address will be accepting comments through 4 p.m. on Thursday, December 3rd. Uh, and then I just want to share that this is, uh, this is a, a, a process that's required under for Chapter 40R of, uh, of Mass General Law for a zoning process, and it's intended to be a public comment period for people to provide comment to react to the draft application, which is posted in the, uh, in the notice for this meeting on the calendar on the city website and also on imaginesalem.org. Uh, so really encouraging attendees to please use this time to provide comment, ideally about the zoning ordinance, but understand if people wanna provide comment about the project in general. The staff will be taking back your feedback around the zoning ordinance specifically, um, and that this is not intended to be a question and answer period, so we won't be getting up and responding to things necessarily. But again, the contact information for both the project team and the city staff that are developing the zoning application will be shared. So if you do have questions, want to engage in some, in some back and forth around specific points that you'd like some more information on, you'll be able to follow up with them by email. Uh, I will also be around for the entirety of the presentation and afterwards if you'd like to speak with me as well. So uh, with that being said, I will turn it over to Dave Gillespie from Avalon Bay uh, to do a brief update on our presentation on the project itself. Thank you, uh, the Mayor said Dave Gillespie from Avalon Bay. With me is Steve Senna from um, Wynn Development. And Avalon and Wynn are a partnership, and what we're gonna show you today, if you have been at our previous uh, meetings in August, is gonna be the same material. So um, there'll be updated material coming, but this is really a city meeting, a city process. We wanted to make sure we level set so that everyone, if you hadn't participated in August, knew what we were talking about. So Avalon and Wynn have a partnership to develop this site, and it really is two companies that do slightly different things but have shared values. Um, we both have track records within the, the state of Massachusetts of 30, 40 years of continuously building and developing high quality housing. Avalon in the generally market rate and mixed income space and then Wynn in the mixed income and senior and historic preservation space. But I think the, the main thing that pulls us together is um, commitment to quality and a long-term vision. And I think those are the things that make it um, a strong partnership. Um, with that, um, 40R is a collaborative planning tool. Uh, it's a uh, collaboration between the City of Salem and a, and a development a project team to come up with something that, that makes sense um, based on shared goals and shared vision. Um, 
and the vision that came from this project is to create housing create housing that we all know that the Commonwealth needs and the city of Salem needs. But we didn't, Avalon and Wynn are relatively new to this to this planning study for this area. This um, project has been planned, this site has been thought about for, you asked President Keenan 10 plus years that he's seen in multiple iterations. We only got involved a couple years ago when the DCAM RFP went out, but I think a lot of you are familiar with and maybe even participated in the working group work that happened in 2019 and 2020 to issue a planning study related to this site and what was possible. The results of that study ended up in a DCAM and Salem State issued RFP, and Avalon and Lynn competitively proposed what you're seeing here tonight for the vision for this site and we're selected against other development teams to be to be the partner here for Salem State and and uh, DCAM. Go to the next. So I think what you can see here is um, a rendering of what we have visioned for the site. And I think the real key is to focus on from a community point of view anchoring this site in open space and improved access to the Forest River Conservation Area. So as you can see, when we started planning, the first thing we thought about is how do you create a connection coming off of Harrison Road to open up and really celebrate this natural resource that exists right on this site. So, what we, so we started with that, and we started with this 20,000 square foot um, open space in the center, but then leads to a gateway that leads to the Forest River Conservation Area, which I imagine most of the folks in this room have been in before. And if you haven't and you're watching on TV, you should come check it out. Um, on the left side of this page, um, you'll see the proposed Avalon building, which is a new, fully new construction building. Uh, it has an internal parking garage to it. If you thought about the Sasaki study from years ago, there was a lot of talk about surface parking. We've really tried to minimize that and focus on and using that as open space instead of surface parking. We do that through creating a uh, parking garage within our building that serves our residents. And then on the upper right portion of the site, you'll see the Harrington Building, which Wynn is adaptively reusing into uh, senior mixed income housing. Wynn also has a new building on the parking lot on Harrison, and then on top of the hill, you can see the adaptive reuse of the historic buildings on site, which was a main um, component of the RFP, is how our um, the development team and, and Wynn gets credit for this, treating the historic resources on site. So with that, I'm um, gonna turn it over to Steve to just do some overview on the numbers quickly before we get into the city portion of the project. Thank you, Dave. Everybody can hear me okay? All right. Um, again, I'm Steve Senna with uh, Wind Development. I'm here tonight. I'm a relatively new member of the project team, um, so I'm meeting some of you for the first time tonight. Uh, but I'm here tonight with a couple of colleagues, many of uh, whom uh, m many of you have uh, met probably before. Adam Stein, Executive Vice President, and Derek Hansen, who is our project director on this project. Um, as Dave indicated, uh, the site plan has not changed very much, or really has not changed since uh, what we've presented to you earlier uh, earlier this year. The same is true for the program, and I'll just take you through uh, some of those details. Program still calls for 475 units with a mix of income levels and, of course, a component of age restriction for active, uh, active adult seniors. Um, the program also still assumes that we will be providing affordability that is uh, greater than what is required under uh, the 40R regs and also greater than what is required under the city's inclusionary house, housing ordinance. Uh, as you'll see in a, in a later slide, uh, there are actually, um, uh, there are actually uh, four um, subzones that will be part of this 40R zoning for this site. And uh, so just to take you through a few specifics as it relates to affordability in subzone one, which is the Avalon component of the development, 10% of the units will be affordable at 60% of area medium income or excuse me or AMI and an additional 10% of units will be affordable at 80% of AMI. In subzones two and three which is the wind component of the project both this building that we're in and then up the hill where the Loring building is um, uh, uh, that component of the project will 40% of the combined units will be affordable at or below 60% of AMI. In addition uh, more than 100 apartments will be designated as active adult senior housing. Uh, these, these units will also be in the wind component of the project. Um, 
Our proposed site plan will set aside more than 67% of the site or 15 acres for public open space and conservation uh, area and trails. And as Dave pointed out, um, when we were looking at the site plan together, this includes a more than 20,000 square foot common green space or central park that will anchor the new development and feed the, feed the open space down, providing connectivity to the conservation area uh, trail network. So by incorporating a mix of unit types, affordability and age restriction, along with the adaptive reuse of historic buildings on the site and a generous amount of open space, we think we have a very strong uh, plan for the redevelopment of this important, pro uh, of this important property uh, and one that provides significant public benefits. As uh, the city and Amanda will present tonight, there's a series of well-defined well steps in the 40R process, which will play out over the next year. Uh, during that time, we will be doing a variety of community outreach and working with the city to share more information about the project as we develop more details and specifics about the proposed design. But as the mayor said, tonight's focus is really on the zoning and we're interested in hearing the, uh, sorry, the city's presentation on that. Thank you. Hi y'all, can you hear me okay? I have head nods in the back. All right, my name is Amanda Chincola. I am the deputy director with the city's planning and community development department. And I'm gonna give you an overview on um, what 40R is as a tool, um, and then talk about the ordinance and the application, the preliminary application that is before you tonight. And a lot of this information is on www.imaginesalem.org. And so I will go through it a little bit quickly um, because I wanna get to the public comments. That's why we're here tonight, is to hear from you. Um, so that's the important piece here. Um, can you go to the next slide, please? So throughout the evening, you're going to hear us refer to smart growth. And the reason for that is um, chapter 40R from Massachusetts general law is, re is referred to as the Smart Growth Housing Production Act. And the intention there is smart growth development. But what does that mean? That's sort of a strange term. Um, this slide shows the basic principles of what smart growth is. It calls for, uh, it's a planning approach that calls for a mixture of uses with a range of housing types, um, with uh, transportation options, and the intent is to create dynamic and livable places. Um, Smart Growth America is the group where these bullet points come from. Um, and I really like their definition of it. And Smart Growth America, they identify above all, Smart Growth is about helping every community become a more economically prosperous, socially equitable, environmentally sustainable, and places to live where everyone can flourish. So that's the goal of Smart Growth. And next slide, please. So Massachusetts General Law Chapter 40R, that's why we keep referring to this as 40R. Um, that's the actual chapter in Massachusetts General Law that allows this type of the zoning tool. It's referred to as the Smart Growth and Housing Production Act. And the intent is to encourage sustainable housing development with a mixture of building types and diverse housing and diverse mobility options. And so the state, through the Executive Office of Housing and Livable Communities, I will say the state throughout the presentation, I am referring to the ARM, the Executive Office of Housing and Livable Communities, um, requires specific criteria for the city to um, enact the a 40R zoning ordinance. And when we meet all that criteria, there are benefits or incentives that the city would see. Um, and some of those benefits include direct financial payments to the city. And so I'll talk about that a little more in the next slide. Um, and I do want to note there are two primary ways that communities go about creating 40R districts. Um, the first approach that you'll see some communities take is when there's an area that's prime, that the, the community wants to see developed, they'll create a zoning ordinance to try to attract developers to that location because they wanna see growth there. Another approach, the second one is the approach we're taking, where we're, we're working in collaboration with a development team, um, where the development project will meet the goals of the city. 
And so the established goals of the city here that you'll hear me talking about um, come from our housing production plan, as well as other plans, including that 2019-2020 uh, Sasaki study that looked at this site. So the minimum requirements uh, that I refer to that the state will be looking at with our preliminary application include um, a, a handful of items. Uh, the first is eligible location. Um, and there's a few ors in there with the eligible location, but the state wants these districts and the future residents to be in amenity rich locations. Um, and so that could mean in ha within half a mile of a train station, um, in areas where it's close to commercial centers, and then also other highly suitable locations. And there's specific definitions on what highly suitable locations are, and I'll talk about that in a, in a few minutes. Um, infrastructure is also looked at as part of this. Um, this the city officials, our city engineer, will need to certify um, with our before we can move forward with the zoning ordinance that the area meets the infrastructure requirements, so sewer, water, uh, the transportation network, the traffic. Um, and if it does not meet the infrastructure requirements, has to say that it could meet, it will meet the infrastructure requirements in the next five years. And so that's something that's ongoing that our city uh, engineer and our traffic and parking department are looking at. It also requires a minimum amount of housing um, under the 40R chapter, it requires 20 units per acre, um, and that's a minimum. It could also be more, um, but it has to have at least 20 units per acre. There's also a minimum affordability, as was referenced. Um, under the state requirements, the ordinance is required to have 20% of the units affordable at 80% of the area median income. But what you'll see and what we're gonna present in this district is more units than that, and some of them are deeper than that 80% requirement. The district, the state also has regulations on the district size. Um, a community couldn't have an entire city be a 40R district. Um, each district is limited to 15% of the land area in the community. And a, a community can have more than one district, and if it does, then cumulatively, all the districts combined cannot be more than a quarter of the land area, more than 25%. Through this process, um, and that's what you'll see in the, in the zoning ordinance, is the process is an as of right approval. And that means that because there's all this upfront work working on the zoning ordinance, when the development project moves forward, it needs to be um, a predictable process. Um, if you build to the height and the setbacks and the design standards that are identified in that ordinance, then it is an as of right. It still goes through a public hearing. Um, it gets notified in the paper and on the, on the city um, website. We, and we do a butter notifications. It will go through a public hearing with the planning board. Um, and then there's opportunities for public comments. And I'll talk more about that process. But as of right just means that there's a predictable process, but it's still a public hearing and there's still opportunities for public comment on the project itself. And then the state also has um, requirements around appeals on those development projects. Uh, the appeals, parties uh, appealing approval must post a bond to cover the potential costs and delay to the developer and that's under the 40R chapter. Next slide. So some of the benefits here, again, there are other communities that, that identify locations to attract development. We have a collaboration here. And so our one of our benefits is that we are looking at the opportunity of growth of a site that is, has been identified for housing. Um, but some of the other benefits we see here are, there is a one-time incentive payment when the ordinance is adopted. Um, and I'll talk about what that incentive payment would look like for this district. There's also a $3,000 incentive payment per bonus unit. Um, and what I mean by bonus unit is the current zoning ordinance would allow some housing here. Um, it's very minimal. For every housing unit that's built above what the underlying zoning would allow, it's a bonus unit. 
And so that's where we get that $3,000 at building permit issuance. There's also this companion law referred to as chapter 40S. Um, and this is where communities, if there is an additional cost for school aged children in the school system, the city can apply for funding to cover that gap. You just need to demonstrate, the municipality would need to demonstrate that there is additional cost uh, with the school kids. And then state funding opportunities we get rated higher on. Um, the city applies for competitive state grants very regularly. Um, we recently received a park grant to renovate Curtis Park. Last year, we had a park grant also for the Willows, um, among many other grants, and we get rated higher on those applications when we have a 40-R district. And it's a proactive tool. Um, when we compare it to something like a 40B, which is referred to as a comprehensive permit, um, if that was the process that this project was going through, we'd be looking at the, the development project um, rather than the zoning for the development project. So here we get to work through what zoning makes sense for it um, before even get into the development projects. So it puts the community in, in charge of helping craft that zoning. And again, it creates the support, uh, the creation of housing. Next slide. So the process is a bit meaty. Um, and that's why we did this, this flow chart. On Imagine Salem, we have another flow chart that sort of goes around like this. And so we try to play with it to present it a little bit differently um, because it's a, it's a long process. Um, but what I want to share is it's longer than a regular zoning ordinance would be. Um, the orange or gold uh, colored in squares show local processes that are unique to Salem. In Salem, we require that a development team have a community meeting before we even talk about the zoning or a 40R district, because we don't want to surprise our community members with something like this. We want you to know that there is a development in the pipeline um, that we might be considering a 40R district for. And so that community meeting has happened for this project. The next step is the preliminary public hearing, and that's where we are tonight. And it sounds really strange, a preliminary public hearing. Um, it's because it's a public hearing on this preliminary application that gets submitted to the state. And in, in the application, we're saying, hey state, are we eligible? Is this district we're proposing eligible for a 40R? Meeting all the criteria that I laid out earlier. Um, but before we do that, we have the opportunity to collect comments on it. And so our draft zoning ordinance is part of the application available in Imagine Salem. And I'm gonna go through that zoning ordinance quickly with you and we would love to hear your feedback on that. And then there's some process that happens between the second and the third box. Um, we don't just jump right to submitting that application to the state. After this public hearing, we're going to collect your comments and we're gonna read them and we're gonna think about those and synth synthesize that information and there could be changes to the ordinance based on that. And so we're looking at what did you, what, what are you telling us about the project? And then if we do make changes to the ordinance, we identify what those changes are when we submit the application to the state. And every comment we receive, the minutes from the meeting tonight will be part of that application. So once all that information is synthesized and we have your comments, um, then we submit the preliminary application to the state and there is a 60 day clock for the state to respond. And there could be three responses. Um, the first is um, they could say that this is an eligible application, go ahead and move forward. Or we could get a letter that says it's conditionally eligible, which means there's conditions to it. We might need to meet, change certain things or meet certain requirements, um, additional requirements to become eligible. Or it could say, this is not eligible. You haven't met the criteria. So those are the three letter, the three options that we would get from the state. And I do wanna note that little star um, notes opportunities for public comment. So the state re responds with that letter of eligibility. If we receive a either conditionally, conditionally eligible or an eligibility letter, um, then we can move forward with local adoption. 
So the blue squares is showing you what a, a typical zoning ordinance would look like. Um, we recently did this in Salem for a coastal resiliency overlay district, if you're familiar with that process. Um, thank you, I see some head shaking. It's, it's, it's a long process as well, and it's layered into this. Um, it starts with a joint public hearing um, with the planning board and the city council. And so we'll do a notification in the paper. We have counselors who thank you very much for sharing the information with your networks, and we post it on the city on the city website um, to let folks know there's this joint public hearing happening. After that hearing is closed, the project, the zoning ordinance will be referred to the planning board for a recommendation. And then it goes back to the city council for two passages. So there's a minimum of four meetings associated with the local adoption. Um, just let that sink in. There's at least four meetings in addition to all the 40 R steps. And oftentimes there are committee meetings baked into that because we might want to tease out some more information in the ordinance. Um, and so that might go to a committee like the um, ordinance, ordinances like uh, OLA, I'll say that. <laughs> um, and then once we get local adoption, I mean, second passage from city council, then we can submit to the state and they'll want to see that the ordinance didn't change, it didn't get kicked out of compliance or is not, no law, we don't want to, we want to make sure we're not no longer meeting the criteria. So they'll review it again. Um, and if they give us the okay and say this still meets the criteria, then it is adopted and we can move forward with it. Well, by we moving forward with it, it means the development team may submit an application. And then we go with the planning board and there'll be a public hearing with the planning board and there'll be opportunities for public comment on the project. Thank you for bearing with me. That was, a, I know, a lot of process there. The last step is just annual compliance and that's administrative. So where we are now, again, we're at that second step um, on the process where this hearing is intended to share information and collect comments on the zoning ordinance. Um, we do have Imagine Salem, wanted to post that again so you know where this information is. Um, we will be taking comments uh, for two weeks until Tuesday, December uh, 3rd at 4 p.m. to the end of the day. And my colleague, Elena, I'll have her email um, up there on the last slide. You can submit comments directly to Elena. Next slide. So now we're transitioning into the proposal. Um, and in the ordinance, there are two sections. Um, we are considering multiple smart growth overlay districts. This is the second, um, well, we're, ca we're calling this smart growth overlay district number two. Um, so what you'll see tonight is an umbrella ordinance and that would apply to all of the smart growth districts and then smart growth overlay district two. That's the one that's before you tonight and it's unique and special to South Campus. In the umbrella district, it's going to have all of the things, again, that's required for each district. It has the purpose, the definitions, the uses that are allowed in all of the districts, um, as well as the process. And the process is really dictated based on the state requirements. And then each sub-district will have its own uses in addition to that and dimensional standards and that sort of thing. Next slide. So the purpose here largely comes from the template from the state requirements um, with the exception of number one, which reads, it enables um, an increase in housing production in resource rich areas of the city that will provide a full range of housing choices for households of all incomes, ages, sizes, in order to preserve the city of Salem's multifaceted community character. Next slide, please. So I'm talking a lot about this SGO2, Smart Growth Overlay District 2. And what I mean by that is, um, sometimes I refer to it as South Campus. It's essentially this blue blurb that you see in the map in the upper right corner. Those are the boundaries of the sub-district that we are discussing tonight. Um, it includes the properties located at eight, 11 20 32 Harrison Road and 262 Loring Avenue. Um, and the list here 
identifies those specific requirements around or the specific criteria that meet the highly um, the otherwise deemed highly suitable locations. So if you if you recall earlier, I showed you for eligible locations, there's a few different things you can meet, one of them being highly suitable locations. And Massachusetts General Law uh, Chapter 40R refers to the Code of Massachusetts Regulations, the CMR, um, and those, all of those sections there, 59.02 and, and so on. And these are the specific requirements that it's um, meeting. And so it, it hits quite a few of them at this site. Uh, we're proposing zoning in a location um, that will encourage compact land use design and mixed use development. Um, is infill and redevelopment of previously developed areas with infrastructure and are likely to help preserve open space. Um, it also has priorly been identified as an area for higher density housing. And that's where we talk about the housing roadmap and our study that we did in 2019 and 2020. Um, and the infrastructure including access to public facilities for stormwater, wastewater treatment, and disposal of public water supply and existing under, underutilized facilities. Next slide. So again, the, the whole subdistrict is the entire outline here. It's about 23 acres. Um, and we're proposing to split it into four subzones. Um, and that's because each subzone is going to have its unique um, dimensional standards and affordability requirements as well. Of the 23 acres, 13 acres are developable and 10 acres are not developable. We are going to be proposing design standards for the entire district. Um, but again, each subzone has its own dimensional and affordability requirements. Next slide. The proposed uses that we're proposing in the umbrella ordinance, and this would be applied to any of the smart growth districts, um, include multifamily residential uses, as well as mixed use with multifamily. And so when I say mixed use, multifamily, it could be um, a retail shop on the bottom with housing above or an office space on the bottom with housing above, as well as accessory uses to the multifamily. What's unique to this subdistrict is um, for the uses, we're also proposing age restricted residential housing, age restricted senior housing, and supportive housing. Next slide. And so these are the dimensional standards, and I'll walk through each one of these sections because they do differ um, and it's color coded. The sub subzone one, shown in yellow, proposes a minimum lot area of 1,200 square feet per unit with a maximum height of 70 feet. And normally I would show you examples of what that looks like, but the renderings do a good job showing you like around what that kind of development could yield. We're proposing 15 foot setbacks for the front and side yard and 30 feet for the rear yard. And these setbacks are pretty similar to what you would see in um, an R1 zoning district, a little bit more restrictive. Um, in R1, it's a 10 foot side yard setback. And then in purple is the subzone two. In subzone two, uh, we're proposing 1500 square feet per unit. And what I mean by that is for every 1500 square feet of lot area, you can have one unit, okay? with a maximum height of 50 feet, a zero front yard setback, and five foot side yard setbacks. And then subzone uh, three is shown in green, requiring 4,500 square feet per unit. Um, so that's the, the least dense, and you'll see it's similar, it's actually would allow for less housing than you would see in an R3 zoning district, which is around 3,500 unit per, uh, 3,500 square feet per unit. It allows for 70 foot heights with a 30 foot front yard setback, a five foot side yard, and a 30 foot rear yard. <clears throat> and all three of these development zones um, call for a, a maximum lot coverage. So think of that like building footprint of 75% of the lot area. 
um, leaving the other 25% as a requirement for open space. Now, subzone four, you'll see in orange, it doesn't have a dimensional table. That subzone is non developable for residential development. Um, it is restricted to conservation land and wetlands. And so, in the ordinance, it's designated as non developable for the purposes of residential. Um, it could have some accessory development for the open space. So, think of like a sign marker um, going to a trail, something along those lines. Next slide. So the affordability, um, as was previously mentioned, does vary um, between the districts. Subzone one, um, it requires 10% of the units to be affordable at 60% of the area or median income, and 10% of the units to be affordable at 80%. So it's 20% of units overall in subzone one. And then subzones two and three combined um, we'll have a 40% of the units at or below 60% of the area median income. So it's well over what the 40R requirements are, as well as what we could get with our inclusionary housing ordinance. Next slide, please. Um, and now we're gonna talk about parking. A lot, so when I talk about this parking chart, what we're referring to is a parking space is required for certain uses. And what is that ratio? How many parking spaces are required for the uses? Um, we're proposing for multifamily residential that for every um, unit, there's one parking space. And then business office is directly from our underlying zone in. That's the same parking requirement. We're proposing one space per employee. Um, professional office is different than business office, think of like medical, dental offices. Um, that requires one space per professional person, plus one space for each two other employees, plus two additional spaces for each professional per person in the case of medical or dental clinics. And then retail is one space um, for every 150 square feet of gross floor area of the retail area, but it excludes the storage. And so those three in the middle are right from the current zoning ordinance. And then the last one is the multifamily housing business office. So if there's a business office associated with the multifamily, that would require one space per employee. And as I mentioned, there are a couple unique uses for the subdistrict that is age restricted and supportive housing. And those uses both require half a space per unit. Um, and that always seems really odd to me to say half a space per unit, because do you build half a space? Um, so I put this math problem because it helps me think about this. Um, when half a space results in a fraction, you round up. So if you had 31 units, it would result in 15.5 spaces, and that means you build 16, you're required to do 16 parking spaces. So I hope that's helpful. Next slide. Um, so I did want to talk about design standards and design guidelines. Um, there are two tools that help you know, guide what the design of a development will look like. Design standards are rules and criteria that focus on the physical design, appearance of the buildings and the public spaces, the way you walk around and, and feel the buildings from the exterior. They're measurable and required standards. And they're different than guidelines, which are advisory and subjective. And so we are going to work on adding design standards to this ordinance. Um, they're going to be created and incorporated to reflect the community preferences. So in the current draft ordinance, you'll see we have our first cut at design standards. I'm not going to go into super depth with them because we're going to have another public meeting focus on design standards. That said, if you have any recommendation, input, suggestions on design standards, we would love to hear that because it's going to help us help start to frame out those design standards and work through them more. And next slide, please. The design standards will have two sections. Again, it's applicable to the entire 40R or the entire SGO2, um, but we break it out into new construction and that will look at site layout and building orientation, building massing and the building facades. 
And then adaptive reuse, that's looking at, you know, reusing existing buildings. And there are five buildings on the site that would be subject to the adaptive reuse portion. Um, so we'll be looking at the architectural elements, accessibility, and site design. So what benefits will the city see from this? Um, I, I've talked about the housing roadmap a little bit, and that's a policy document that the city worked on a few years ago. It was a community vetted process and approved by the city council. And it, it outlines 30 strategies to meeting our housing goals. Um, but the housing roadmap in general identified there's a need to increase our housing supply, particularly our affordable units. Um, and this project would achieve that. And it also, some of those strategies in the housing roadmap include things like leveraging state uh, funds and other resources, leveraging land uh, for the creation of housing. And so there's a couple of strategies that we meet through that housing roadmap. Um, and again, one of the important pieces is it creates a pathway for creating new housing. And I do wanna note, aside from the benefits of the 40R incentive program, uh, this site is currently a tax exempt property. The new growth from this zoning will lead to over a million dollars in new tax revenue. So that's just in new tax revenue. In addition to that, we get these sort of bonus one-time payments from the state we get a zoning incentive payment of about a $350,000, um, and that's after the ordinance is approved by city council. And then there are bonus unit payments that I mentioned. That's $3,000 for every bonus unit above what the underlying zoning would yield, and that's about $1.3 million at build out. As was mentioned, there's about 475 units for the site, but around 433 of the bonus units. And that concludes my presentation and overview of the district and the zoning ordinance. Um, so here's our, our public comments uh, section. We wanna focus the public comment, as the mayor had said, to the zoning ordinance. Um, and so we appreciate your feedback and look forward to it. Um, the zoning ordinance, again, is the umbrella ordinance in that sub-district. And all the comments tonight will be included in the application to the state, and we will take a look at them as we finalize the application. Um, so if you wish, um, you may state your name and address at the top of your comments. Please direct your comments to the city and not to each other. Um, this is an opportunity to collect comment. We're not doing a question and answer, but if you do have questions about the zoning, you can contact my colleague, senior planner, Elena Eimer, um, or myself. My name again is Amanda Chincola. Um, if you have questions about the project itself, um, you can use this email address. It's info at forestriverresidences.com, and that's the development team's um, email where they're uh, responding to comments about the project. We also have some comment cards at the desk in the back, so if you wanna write a comment rather than saying it, you can do that. And again, this is a lot of information, so if you're not comfortable, you're not ready to provide a comment, you can also send an email. So I wanna just note that again. And this whole presentation will be on Imagine Salem. This meeting, again, is being recorded by SATV, and the recording will be on Imagine Salem as well. All right, so we are going to um, walk around. So if you want to just raise your hands with public comments, and we'll bring a microphone over so you can um, speak it that way. Um, hi, Claire Benkel on Grant Road in Salem. Um, and I'm watching this whole presentation and I've been to the other two meetings and I kind of have a feeling that we're kind of putting the cart before the horse, so to speak. Um, we had some questions as, you know, residents in this area that we thought were going to have answered before this whole process took place. And I'm still waiting for answers. Um, I have an article here that was on Councilor Varela's website who stated 350 uh, apartments and now we're up to 475 and no one seems to be able to tell me why that number jumped and the other question is we asked for a traffic study because we wanted it done in October based on 
the traffic that we have with you know haunted happenings, the kids going back to school, the college being back in session, and now we have the ambulances up and down Loring Avenue. We haven't gotten any answers. And so I would like the council and the city to take a look at what we're requesting and get us some answers. Hi, uh, I'm Mark Steele. I live at 214 Loring Avenue, right around the corner here. And I have three uh, comments on the presentation. Uh, I would like to get a response as to how under 40R overlay, where the requirement is within a half a mile of mass transit and a half a mile of shopping area. This particular site that we're on right now is a mile and a half from Salem Depot and a mile to a mile and a half from, from um, Vinden Square Shopping Center. So it seems to fall clearly outside of that, that requirement. Uh, secondly, you said that in overlay uh, number two, no, overlay number two, uh, after the umbrella for section number two where the main part of the 350 housing units are gonna be, that the construction was, was, is planned to be five stories. The current buildings are four stories. You had said that the maximum height is 70 feet. Now, I don't know, it seems like 70 feet is higher than five stories to me. Maybe it's not, I don't know, maybe they're, you know, but so um, what I would like to know is how tall, if five stories is one thing, but how tall actually are those buildings going to be? And thirdly and lastly, um, the bonus payments of $350,000 and $1,300,000, it seems to me that we're going to have to, increase the, the the different the electricity the sewage the the improve the roadways and 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 how much of that falls in the lap of the city of salem the cost of improving sewage uh water supply electricity all the all the utilities including the road you know the the entrance way of harrison road that seems to me that that could easily cost way more than two million dollars to me so I'd like to find out a number of dollars, the expense it's going to be for this area to be improved to accommodate 475, 400 units back here. Thank you. Hi, Jason McAdam, uh, 2A Harrison Road. I uh, just want the city to comment on potentially having another road to lead to the development beyond just the entrance to Harrison Road, like where the parking lot is. I'm, I'm pointing here, you can't see it, out into Loring Ave just due to traffic concerns. I may be reiterating what other people have said, but there does seem to be concerns about traffic coming through that one point in Harrison Road. Uh, and since I do live on Harrison Road in a single family, uh, just comment on the possibility of eminent domain uh, would be nice to know. Alan Hoffman, 23 Valiant Way. I'd like to better understand how the infrastructure payments and the payments to the city for new and needed in infrastructure as questioned previously by this gentleman. I would assume you probably need a new firehouse. You'll need sewage. I mean, we, we had water main breaks down Loring Ave. You know, this is a very old town and the infrastructure is very old. So I, I don't quite understand where the money for the infrastructure improvements are coming. And that would get eaten up by the one-time payments. And also the one-time payment for school, you said that the state may pay 
three thousand dollars for students. Well, May is a ve May pay with the state is a very slippery slope. Thank you. Thank you for all these comments. I do just want to respond to a couple. I know it's not a question and answer, but. Um, in terms of the highly suitable location, um, I, I provided that list which shows specific um, criteria identified in, in the Code of Massachusetts regulations that allow for if you meet these criteria, you'd be identified, it would be identified as highly suitable locations. And so it doesn't, a 40 hour doesn't need to be within half a mile of a train station or within a commercial center. It can also meet these other highly suitable locations. And so that's what we're proposing. We do have um, a comprehensive uh, list also with more details in the application. So if you want, I can meet with you after and we can, we can chat more about that. Um, in terms of infrastructure, I do want to know when new development is created in Salem, um, if there's an increase in, in improvements needed to serve that infrastructure, that's on the development to make those improvements. And so when you see a sewer pipe isn't large enough or a road or you need a signal, the development bears that cost of making those improvements. Um, in terms of the, the funding, that money where that goes, those incentive payments, those would go to the general fund. And then the city council would identify, the, the mayor puts forward a budget every year and that gets approved by the city council as part of the whole general fund. Um, there are a lot of other comments in there and I, I really appreciate those. We're gonna look into them because I don't have responses to everything. Hi, Dick Lindemann, uh, 113 Federal Street here in Salem. I think we need to also recognize that this is one of many projects. So we need to look at things holistically because we've got this project that we're talking about, but let's not forget, especially with respect to traffic, we have, I call it the Bertini project up there at Bertini's. That's gonna generate an awful lot of traffic there. We're also talking about the 40 hour over at Shetland Office Park. That's going, that's an even bigger project than this one. So we need to consider what's going to happen with traffic flow and how are people going to move around the city. So the other person's question about traffic stay, I think, is incredibly important for us. Thank you. Thanks. Linda Ferrarosso from Audub um, Aurora Lane. Um, some of these are touched on already, but um, the fact that people are talking about utilities and the impact it may have on our city. Um, there's already several new developments that we have had in this city. We've got Traders Row, the Bertini project is enormous. And lest we forget, we are in a drought situation here. The Ipswich River is at its lowest point ever. And I wanna know that somebody is talking to the Ipswich River watershed to find out what the impact, we are not the only community that uses the Ipswich River for our water. I, I haven't even thought about electricity or the others. I'm cons very concerned about the water. Um, I live off a of Highland Ave. We have had a number of water breaks since I have lived here in 12 years. One that created almost $3,000 worth of damage in my basement, but the good news was is that the manufacturer of the um, of the little, what's the little rubber thing there? I don't know much about plumbing. Uh, huh? No, 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 it's just the, it, that doesn't matter. Um, the company who manufactured it paid for all the damage. Um, otherwise, let me see a couple other things. Um, one of the things is I, I did take a chance to, to read as much as I could um, one of the problems I did have were the links in the preliminary application, the, the hyperlinks did not work. None of them did. I contacted um, somebody to the, oh, it was you, yes, thank you very much. I don't know, you did. I see, yeah, but. Yeah, what happens is all the information I was looking for, you would just scroll all the way down. It's an right. enormous document. And I spent much time this afternoon, unfortunately I did not get through a good deal of it to keep looking at. But one of the things that it took 
there was one box, and that was in the design standards section, I believe. It says, we checked the box no on the application, which said, what it does not require, mitigation of extraordinary adverse impact on neighboring properties. I'm concerned that neighboring properties are going to be impacted and we have checked the box no, that we're not doing anything about it. That's alarming. We should be worrying about our neighborhoods. Um, I had one, <clears throat> excuse me, last thing, and that is I am certainly hoping that the majority of these units will go to existing Salem residents, and we are not opening up the doors for more Boston, Cambridge, et cetera, people to move here because that is what's happened with many of our developments to date. We are not preserving these for the people, for the residents and our fellow citizens here. Thank you. Polly Wilbert, 7 Cedar Street. So I'm concerned about where we're going with density. Um, the city of Salem already has, at, in eight square miles, 5,600 people per square mile. In Peabody, they have 3,200 in their 17 square miles. Danvers has 2,000 in their 13 square miles. And Beverly has 1,870 in their 22 square miles. We're already incredibly dense and we're adding density in a way that is going to significantly impact all of us because we're already a dense community. We're adding a tremendous amount of housing. We're not adding jobs that are comparable in the cost of the housing. Um, we're at, what we're doing is adding a lot of low level jobs downtown in retail that's not supportive of expensive housing. Inevitably, these will be largely market rate housing units. This is not largely um, affordable housing. That yes, there's 25, 20 or 25% affordability, but it's not a majority affordable. Um, the other thing is we're not talking about the TIFs. After all of these developments, we inevitably give back a tax break and they're five, 10, or 20 years of tax breaks. You're talking about a million dollars a year in new tax revenue, but how much of are we planning to give back right after they hand off the keys to the, to the properties? We've seen this at City Council every single time. We give back money because we're compensating for the affordable housing. We're paying for it, in part. So I think we're getting limited information when we're deserving more information and more whole, wholesome information. You talk about another hearing with the planning board. I've been in multiple joint city council planning board hearings. They get closed at the end of the night. They rarely stay open. There's limited time for comment. They're not interested in hearing from us. And the system doesn't really work to allow us to fulsomely input into these kinds of complex, large projects. And I agree, water, we should all be concerned about water. We're learning a lesson right now. People are starting to talk about how we should limit our water. There are 14 at least communities using water from the Ipswich River before it gets to our reservoirs, which are shared with Beverly. We're playing with fire on this. Um, as we all know, there's not enough water to put out the brush fires we have now. We need to be cautious about this. This is long-term significant impact, and traffic is a real impact on our lives, and it's backed up. We're handing off the functionality of moving traffic around for bikers and walkers, and it's slowing everything down, and it's frustrating people, and it's making it dangerous. Uh, Vicki Siriani, 194 Lafayette Street. Uh, I just want to comment on Polly's comments because it seems to me that as we look at these projects individually, 
we're not looking collectively at the four 40R proposals in this city. We are not looking at the population increase. If you look at Shetland Park, I believe it's up the number of something like 2,500. We are talking about thousands of people in a city that is already strapped from a transportation standpoint, from a traffic standpoint. And so I think it would be incumbent on the planning office to really look at all of these projects in their entirety at what they are going to do overall to a city that at this point in time, you cannot on a Saturday morning, you cannot get from one end of Salem to the other in less than 10 minutes. These are really significant issues. And the question is, is how big do we want to be? Hi, uh, Neil Harrington, 61 Weatherly. Uh, for those of us who live up around the other end of Dead Man's Curve, uh, as one of the gentlemen said earlier, there's been a significant number of water main breaks in the last couple of years. So I would respectfully ask that the city, perhaps at the developer's expense, take a look at the condition of the mains that are gonna be servicing the development here because uh, the existing situation uh, is clearly problematic. Several of us have had water breaks over the last couple of years, uh, and that happens in an older city. We understand that, but if you're going to add this many units that could be serviced by that main on Lowering Avenue, that you may want to take a closer look at that. And the second comment I had is uh, relative to the number of minimum parking spaces. Uh, I know it's not a question and answer, but if uh, if I'm not going to ask, be allowed to ask a question, I'd like to just make a comment that I think you should leave room for visitor parking. If you've got uh, a half of parking space per unit that somewhat assumes that there isn't going to be anybody there other than one, one every other person that has one car. Uh, so I would respectfully suggest you leave enough room in your planning for visitor parking spaces. Thank you. Hi, my name is Lydia King. I live at 4 Forest Avenue um, up the road. Um, we have a housing crisis in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. It's the entire state is having a housing crisis, right? Somerville and Cambridge are focusing on density also to solve that problem. Salem has to do it as well. Um, if you look at cities across the country, look at Minneapolis, they instituted multifamily housing by right citywide in 2018 and four years later their rent prices for one and two bedroom apartments went down like it didn't just stabilize it went down so density does solve problems um i'm happy to see that there's senior living units i'm happy to see that there's uh you know uh, certain amounts under certain ami for the area but but density on its own also does help and we do have to do our fair share, frankly, as a city. This is not a problem that's just going to go away. Um, um, I will say my background is um, in economics. So like supply and demand is not that complicated. It does, it works. This is how pricing works. Um, I just wanna also note that in Salem, we do have a decreasing school age population despite really good year-over-year -year results in our schools. That's because people cannot afford to stay here with their children. They're getting priced out of Salem and young families cannot afford to raise children here. The cost of childcare is too high. They can't find apartments. The average cost of a two bedroom apartment in Salem last year was $2,800. Um, that's a lot. And speaking of seniors, I work in the Medicare space. We are halfway through Medicare annual open enrollment right now, as a lot of you probably know. Um, uh, a report came out today that almost 20% of Medicare beneficiaries are seeing their Part D uh, prices, premium prices going up this year, right? And many of those seniors are on fixed incomes. Um, if you are a senior who has your housing cost is, is not something you have to worry about because you own your home that's great. It's possible you're over housed and you have a home that's too big. Maybe there's a second story that you are unable to get to, right? 
being able to downsize and have apartments that are affordable and accessible for seniors is huge. The cost of living is going up. The cost of health care is going up. And that is the number one most important cost to seniors. So when we look at our community and we think about it as a community, it, it, we're really measured in how we take care of our most vulnerable populations and our seniors and our children um, are two of the best examples of that. So if we don't have a Salem where our seniors and our young families and our children can stay, and if they're priced out, then that's not really the Salem that we all know. So, yeah. I'll, I'll just take it, sorry. Um, Skylar Ward for Forest Avenue as well. Um, I'm a high school coach. Uh, I have a lot of my students that will be leaving to go to college and hopefully coming back to Know, enter into the workforce in Salem. Uh, there are businesses starting in Salem, a lot in the tech industry. Uh, so a lot of people can work from home and remotely um, and be a great opportunity for them to be able to afford an apartment and have apartments be available within the city. Um, and um, I think this is a great use in uh, this property specifically. It's a great deal of not very heavily used space currently. Um, from the university and the tax revenue per year will help in our bottom line for the budget as well. Uh, hopefully, so we can reallocate some more money to the schools and yeah, get better structures and facilities and whatnot for our youth so we can continue growing families and young people in the city. Thank you. Megan Emmer, 27 Surrey. Um, I generally support this whole project and the zoning, um, but my main concern is access to um, the conservation area and preserving access, basically, um, let's say parking, um, which we've enjoyed maybe one or two spots under the current um, setup. And maybe if, if using zoning to require um, either bike parking or something like that, um, some sort of maybe one or two spots for people who can't ride their bikes um, to, the, to the area. I just wanna make sure that the access to the Forest River area is preserved. Ellen Galligan, 22 Cleveland Road. Um, I want to thank all of the neighbors and other people who've spoken out tonight. Many of what has been said tonight, we have said previously. I have been a longtime advocate for those of you who know me in the city for um, affordable housing, for housing for everybody. We had hoped there would be more senior housing at this site when they had the meeting several years ago. Um, but I do have to speak to density. As much as we need housing, I don't agree that density is always good. Density can have, um, I guess, some of the positive aspects that we heard about earlier, but density can also create other issues, not just for the surrounding people, not just for the infrastructure, and we know that that's a huge issue. Thank you for those of you who spoke about water and water breaks and brown water. In our neighborhood, it's brown water, brown water, brown water. Um, but density isn't good for the people moving in either. Everybody needs a little bit of space to live in a healthy, both mentally and physically way. So um, I just would, I, I like the fact that there's a real mix in this. We know we need more housing. I want to just go on public record to say it's too many units in this area and probably in the other areas also, but I have to say I've not looked at those closely. Thank you. just want to open up the floor to any first time commenters before we return to folks who have already had the opportunity to speak tonight. I just had one other comment, and thank you for giving me the opportunity. I couldn't remember everything, and my notes were kind of wishy-washy. 
Um, I'm not totally opposed to this project. I understand the part about senior housing goes a long way for some of us with white hair. I don't need it yet, but I may someday. Silver. Silver, oh, thank you. Oh, well, you're in the same group with me. Um, so, and at one point, they, they talked about developing this whole area as senior housing. But I'm glad to see there is some. So I'm not totally opposed. I am very worried, as this young woman over here said, about the conservation area. That's an area I visit regularly. I'm concerned that it is some of the conservation area is going to be um, taken for, there'll be some left, but some will be taken. But mostly I'm concerned because I don't understand what would happen to this project if we still built it, but we didn't do a 40R. I don't, what would be the difference? Um, that's the part that worries me because as far as I can see, and I am not an expert by any way, shape, or form, I look at this and say, we are giving up, we are giving the developers full access to making all this decision about these huge projects in Salem. And is that what we want to do? That's, that's my observation. I'm sure I'm missing pieces of this. That's the part that scares the living daylights out of me, that once we get 40R and we can have up to 25% of our surface area here in Salem, that they can just develop anything the way they want, and that worries me to death. Um, just a small thing I forgot to say. Um, the city did a roadmap, housing roadmap. They did two years of research into that roadmap and produced a plan. Um, it's accessible online. Um, it, it's, it's a little bit of a read through. Uh, you know, it's, it's a page flipper. You can get through it. Um, but I do suggest everyone read that plan. Um, gives some some questions, answers, um, and yeah. Thank you. That's one thing I forgot. Hi there, I'm Jim Rose at 25 Linden Street here in Salem. And one of the concerns I have is that uh, since we are gonna have a number of seniors living here, presumably not all of these people are gonna be driving as much as some of the younger folks. Will there be shuttle buses to connect them to the new South Salem train station or other destinations? Uh, can we use the, uh, what's what's the Salem shuttle? The skipper. Yeah, they'll wanna make sure that there's plenty of skipper access so people can get our, so people can get to their destination, whether it's Market Basket or downtown. Just I think those are important because to the extent that we can re re reduce the vehicular traffic coming in and out of Loring Avenue, I mean that's that is a major question. Polly Wilbert, Seven Cedar Street again. So the. Planning board review of a project like this is 120 days. It, this is an enormous project. I watched the um, review for the Bertini site. It took much longer than that. The developers went uh, off and sold part of their development to another investor. They came back, they totally changed the project. Um, there were many changes along the way. It, in no way, could that 250 unit development be, be reviewed successfully in 120 days? This project is twice the size of that. I just think that the limitation under 40R for the planning board review on our behalf, on the, our community's behalf, is not subst substantive. It's not sufficient. This is gonna be a complex project it's gonna have a lot of bells and whistles to it. It deserves a complete and thorough review. To limit it to 120 days under 40R is not sufficient. Uh, 23 Valiant Way, Alan Hoffman. Once again, thank you. 
I'm not sure that I understand what's going to happen to the residences on Harrison now. I feel that we should be looking out for them. If we check the box that uh, this young lady over here mentioned that we are not going to help them mitigate their problem. They're the Salem residents now. They've, I don't live anywhere near that space, but to build a project on their front lawns without helping them mitigate the problems, it could be, as this gentleman said, by eminent domain, it could be by buying the property, but we can't just hang those people out to dry. If you took the number of years of the impacted people on Harrison and some of the abutters, the number of years that they've been Salem residents, and you're just saying that you're not gonna help them mitigate it? What are we doing to our own community people and opening it up to outsiders? These people here on Harrison have to be taken care of. And it's up to either the developer or the city to make them whole. Thank you. Hi, I'm Alyssa Rose Martin. I live at 12 Buchanan. Um, I guess I'll say in general, I think it makes a lot of sense. I do think we need um, greater intensity in order to meet the housing crisis across the Commonwealth and here in Salem. I know many families that are um, packed in, living, um, living really at 30% AMI and not having um, very good options for housing. So I'm excited about that. I'm excited about the open space. Um, I do think I wonder about the timelines. I wonder if we could do better on like having the results of the traffic study before we before and the water study before we have to um, make these make these calls make like final like why do we have to finalize this before we really know what those impacts are going to be? And then the other specific thing I would say is the developers are offering a certain like it was a ten percent at thirty percent AMI, but our um, SRO two um, ordinance did not have anything at 30% AMI. And so could we, why are we, uh, why are we having a ceiling above what they're doing? Could we get some 30% AMI? Because really the average Salem household is, is really at 60% AMI because it's based on the whole Boston Metro. I don't know if people will know that. Um, I think that's it, thank you. Good afternoon or good evening. My name is Arthur Francis. I live on Harrison Road, right on the corner at Loring Avenue. I happen to probably be the oldest person here right now. At the end of war, in, in World War II, I was in the Navy, 10 years in the Navy, and immediately after that, another uh, 19 years in the Air Force. And when I got out of the Air Force, <clears throat> I bought a house down here at uh, Loring Avenue. I'd like to stay there. And in the meantime, while this is being all built up down here at the new uh, complex, there's gonna be all sorts of traffic coming down the only street, not traffic, but construction people everywhere. And for me, I probably won't be around for that, but my wife is gonna be here, and it's gonna be awful hard in her to have all this uh, construction work and everything else, or maybe even kick us out of our house. I don't want to do that, okay? Any other comments? Well, thank you all for coming. Again, I appreciate this discussion and we will have another meeting specific on design standards. So just keep an eye out for the calendar. Um, if 
if you would be so kind and be willing to, we'd love it if you'd sign in, particularly if you provided public comments, because it helps with the minutes. Um, I want to make sure I get your names right um, for the folks who provided their names. Um, it, we can also share that list with the development team if you want to get updated on the project to stay updated on the zoning efforts. Again, we have that information available at imaginesalem.org. Um, and I will turn it over to the mayor. Thanks, Amanda. I want to thank you all again for coming this evening. Uh, this presentation will be up on Imagine Salem, uh, as Amanda said. The contact information is there if you have follow-up questions that you'd like more information on. As I mentioned, I'm, I'm going to stick around, so if you want to talk to me one-on-one, -on -one, I recognize that not everybody's comfortable speaking in a public setting, so if you'd like to just come up and talk to me, I'll be here as well. Uh, I do want to say that there was some talk about eminent domain, and there's no eminent domain in this project. There's no taking of houses or, or anything of that nature. Uh, the project site is uh, in the sub... Um, in the zone that's in the overlay zone that's described, uh, which is the South Campus property. So, uh, so, uh, so with that being said, I want to say thank you again for coming. Uh, this recording will be on the website. It'll be on SATV. And uh, again, the, the contact information to submit written comment uh, for the period through December 3rd is also up on the screen now. Thank you.